this place is why we are all here. And now everyone else that lives here today is because of this one place, hmm. in my opinion. Hey there! So in my last video, I learned about the Cliff Mine. It was arguably the first major mechanized copper mine in North America, and it happened to be here in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, largely thanks to a really cool geology story. You can catch up on the last episode if you'd like to learn more. In the mid-1800s, the cliff produced millions of tons of copper, and it also set the stage for the larger copper boom that happened in this area. If you're familiar with the gold rush out in California, well, the copper rush of people flocking to Michigan's Keweenaw Peninsula came first, and it helped get this deeply useful metal all over the growing United States. So the cliff mine was a bit of a big deal. Except today, you really can't tell. Right now, the cliff is basically a collection of ruins in the middle of a forest. And as I worked on that last video, I kept wondering, how do we know what people did here more than a hundred years later? Because all the details, well, they're not all in photos or drawings or written records. As it turns out, though, I knew just the person to ask. While I was working on a video about the Quincy smelter back a year ago, I met Dr. Sean Goman. He's a key player in maintaining that facility, but he also has a doctorate in industrial heritage and archaeology. And when he was a master's student in 2010, he started Michigan Tech University's Cliff Mine Archaeology Project, which was an effort to use archaeology to understand what really happened at the cliff. So last fall, Sean took me on a hike around the ruins of the mine and helped me understand not just how this place operated, but also some of what archaeology actually looks like as a science. I thought this was incredibly interesting, and I feel like I understand this field a lot better because of it. So if you're someone who is also into cool jobs, asking questions, and poking around outside, I think you'll enjoy this conversation. We started our hike just off of Cliff Drive in the Keweenaw Peninsula. This side of the road is basically mine territory, while the town of Clifton, where people lived, was located a ways across the street. And while I was busy staring at the piles of waste rock and trying to get my bearings, Sean kicked off my intro to archaeology by pointing out that I was standing on the wall of an old building. So we're basically standing in that kind of like nexus between the community and the mine itself. And so we are standing right inside where the former mine office building was. So oh. you are currently standing on a foundation wall. There's another foundation wall. There's another foundation wall right here. There's an interior wall. You can just kind of see it there. So there was like a two story um, office building here. And then all of the residents for the most part, lived on the other side of Cliff Drive in um, a community there that had three churches, dozens and dozens of log cabins and framed homes and things like that. You're saying like, that's a wall. How do you know that was a wall? So what is, what is the, you know, think about what is the basic material that you would have to build a foundation for any home in like the 19th century? Okay. Stone. Here in a mine, you have all the stone you could ever want coming from underground. And so if you see a series of stones that kind of look in alignment, if you look here, you can see a right angle. There's oh. no stones over here. There isn't really anything going on here, but you can see this right angle um, in a line. And so we can assume that that is a foundation. We could excavate here to test that theory. We also have historic photographs. We know that in this general location, there was the office, um, we also have historic maps that kind of label okay. things cool. so so we know what was here even though the landscape's very different from what it was like then um you can still kind of recreate that so we've never been able to identify exactly where the school was probably did not have as stout of foundations it was just a little one-story uh, framed building this was like a stone and framed two-story office building that had a safe in it and big desks and all of that so it had to be a more a st more stoutly built building and therefore the evidence of it probably is going to remain better so there's lesson one look for clues everywhere because there's history all over a site like this after this we picked our way across the creek and headed up the hill and into the woods and almost immediately we started seeing building foundations so now we start we're you're going to start seeing foundations once you get into the woods past the rock pile you'll start seeing foundations like this but we actually don't know what that was i think it's i think at some point it was a barn but we don't know what its original function was because you wouldn't make a barn out of stone 
that's a lot of effort just to like store hay. Ultimately, we headed to the place where the mine began. There's more on the history of the cliff mine in the previous episode, but to give a quick summary, at some point, someone spotted copper in these cliffs, which eventually led to people digging a tunnel and finding a huge amount of metal. And shortly after that, the mine really got started. Basically, where I'm standing right now is where the mine began. And so that earliest shaft is right down over this way. Oh, it's cool. buried now. There used to be a little shack built over it. There really is no evidence that there is a mine shaft there anymore. And they built a second shaft, which was right over here. So number one shaft over there, the number two shaft was right here. Okay, and it's just basically the little depression. It's just this little depression. It's been all, it was all filled in by the 1850s. Okay. So this was going on in the 1840s. The, the mid to late 1840s, and then it was pretty much filled in. And when you say that like a shaft like this is filled in, is it, how filled in is filled in? I'm not here to push my limits, I'm just curious. It's, we, it's different. So in the 1960s, Calumet and Hecla, the company owned most of the land around the whole, uh, most of the Keweenaw, the mining lands. They went out and started filling things in and they filled it with whatever they had. So they would throw rail ties in there, they'd throw old cars in there. <laughs> mattresses, whatever, to just get it to the point where nothing is falling anymore. And then maybe they pour a concrete cap over the top. We do not know here, the cliff company could have just dumped waste rock down this. This shaft was like pretty much not used anymore after, um, you know, after the 1850s. So it might have just been forgotten about. I was fascinated by this idea that there are mine shafts out there that just have like 1950s and 60s cars. It's terrifying. Yeah. Just chilling in them. It's terrifying. Yeah. Stuff like this is so wild to me. This sort of disregard for the landscape is something I can't really comprehend. And it's a topic I've been slowly circling in on ever since I started making these videos. But for now, this is a video about archaeology. And this is where I really started to learn more about Sean's expertise. This is the first major construction on the site. This was the engine house number one. This was put up in the early 1850s um, and it's housed a large steam engine and that engine was used to both uh, drive a pump to you know lift water out of the mine and the engine was sited right here. It also ran a hoist drum mm -hmm. and so that was how they were able to raise and lower material and people in and out of the mine over time. Is that a uh, similar, but on a smaller scale to what's at Quincy right now? Absolutely. Cool. So like this hoist, you can kind of make, if, you, if you're up here, you can kind of make out that the width of the hoist was maybe six feet. Oh, okay. As cool. opposed to the <laughs> right. like 35 feet wide or whatever it is at Quincy. And so what an engine house is, is a, I mean, it literally looked like a house for one thing. It was a, had this stone foundation so there would have been a plank floor, um, would have had a framed structure on top, you know, just wood clabbered siding. And then you had the engine on one side. Here in the center part, there would have been two uh, cylindrical, you know, like railroad locomotive boilers. And from there you can use, here they'd be using wood at that time to um, heat up water, to create steam, to help drive that engine. And then of course all, the exhaust from that burning of that wood has to go somewhere. And so that was directed up. Oh, hello. This yeah. smokestack. Okay. How do you figure something like this out? You come out here and you see what to me looks like a pile of rocks in the middle of the woods. How do you go about figuring out like, oh yeah, this is what happens here. So first, you know, you look for clues um, on that, on the landscape. The smokestack is a big clue. The smokestack tells you something burned here. And if we know, if we contextualize within the era, this is the 19th century, how, you know, why would you have a smokestack such as this? It's probably for some sort of industrial purpose, right? We know we're in a mining district, so uh, we're probably looking at something related to the mine. So what you look at is the, the clues on the ground, the orientation of this floor plan, especially this room here, this middle room with these two chain, these two like similarly sized chambers with like a central, thing in the middle. That's just a clue because usually you have more than one boiler mm -hmm. to run like a stack this size sure. or machinery this size. You're going to have more than one boiler. You need to create, generate a lot of steam. You also 
rely on historic documents, which we have lots of for the cliff. They tell you exactly when this building was built and kind of basically where it was situated. If you understand where the mine shafts are, you can kind of get an idea of where you would be putting a hoist building and an engine yeah. for the hoist. So you can kind of work your way backwards. So is a lot of archaeology, at least in this context, using basically just like logicking things out? Yeah, um, at, at this level. When you get into excavation, you start with that. And then when you get into excavation, you're really concerned about context. In archaeology, really, that, as a science, it should just be called context <laughs> okay. ology because it's all about associating the things that you're looking at here with something a little bit at a, at, a, at a larger scale, whether it's in an excavation unit or on a landscape scale such as this. When we were here in 2010, mapping this whole site, you'll notice every tree, there's no branches out above six feet. Oh. Or I mean below six feet, yeah. sorry. Now, now there's no branches that. below six <laughs> right. feet. You only cut and, off the, the tall ones. Yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> And so, and that was so that we could get in here and do our recording and our measurements and things like that. And so over time, that's just remained. Partly it's because everything's more accessible, people are coming through, which does damage and degrade everything more rapidly. It's more interpretable. It's easier to interpret. It's more accessible for the visitor if they came here. Interesting. It's more easy for me to tell you what's going on in that space with those boilers. I would not have been able to tell that to you um, very clearly 12, 13 years ago. As we kept walking, Sean showed me a few more features, including a building that used to house a piece of equipment called a man engine. I've mentioned these briefly before, but I really like the way Sean talks about the people side of the story here. You then, in 1850s, you have this engine house that's built. Eventually, there's gonna be two more engine houses up on top of the cliff, one at the run right at the edge and another one about a thousand feet further back. But they needed something to replace those two smaller shafts. So in the late 1850s, they built a new mine shaft that was took those two shafts and basically doubled the size. Uh -huh. And that was right here under this rubble. Built on top of the Avery shaft was a stone shaft house. Usually the shaft houses at this time are just framed buildings, clabbered siding, um, simple. They're basically shelters to protect the shaft. So there is a technology called the man engine. The man engine was an innovative technology that had already been used in Cornwall and in Germany for quite a while. This was something that was well known over there. Nobody in North America was doing it We just because we simply didn't have mines that were that deep. We have to remember mm. this is 1850s. The gold rush is only a couple years okay. old. We don't yeah. have a mineral or a mining heritage in, in the Americas yet, sure. yeah. at least not in this part of the Americas. Right. But what we do have in the Copper Country is a whole lot of Cornish engineers who came here and they brought with them their knowledge from back home. And one of those individuals brought the knowledge of the man engine with him here. And so in the 1860s, so the shaft was built in the late 1850s, but by the 1860s, they were like, we need to find a more efficient way to get people in and out of the mine more quickly. And he said, well, let's use the man engine. So what the man engine is, is basically two, two rods, reciprocating motion that helps to pump water, but you can attach platforms to those rods uh -huh. and people can ride the platforms and hop off one to the other as they're moving. Um, but they're very small, you know, they're just a few feet by a few feet and you stand on it and then you jump over to the other side and you jump back over to the other side. The man engine was sighted right over here. Um, and you can actually, there's still, there's even a pipe coming out. We don't know if this, you know, this is probably from um, the more recent past that this was here, but we, this is going underground. The shaft is under there. And if you come around the corner, you can actually see a doorway and you can kind of picture oh. how the workers would have come through um, and then, you know, came into the, to the shaft house mm -hmm. and then down. This is a massive, it's, it's hard to imagine how yeah. big of a complex these walls give an idea. And you can actually see that, that little bit on the end there, how it's in line. Like that's a retaining wall. And that was part of the building, the structure that went across that way. Now we're gonna go out the door. If you poke around the cliff today, you'll see evidence of how the property changed over the decades and with different owners. But I was specifically curious about the excavations they'd done at this site and how that worked. 
So Sean and I headed over to the old stamp mill. For context, here's a quick crash course on how things flowed at this mine around the 1850s. If you chiseled out a huge piece of copper, great, that was basically ready for shipping. But for smaller pieces of metal, there was more of a process. These smaller pieces of copper were typically attached to or embedded in other rock. So workers needed a way to separate the waste rock from the good shiny stuff. And ultimately, that involved a stamp mill. Essentially, a collection of steam-powered mechanical stamps was used to smash the rock. Then water was used to separate the heavier copper mineral from the lighter waste rock. And while the copper could then be prepped for storage, everything else was washed away into the landscape. This stamp mill is where the Cliff Mine Archaeology Project did most of their excavating while Sean was involved. But before we get there, I should probably tell you a bit about how this project even got started, and why. Or rather, I'll let Sean do it. It was his master's thesis. Why, why did you pick this for your master's thesis? <laughs> because I didn't have a project. <laughs> um, I was in my final semester of my master's program. I still didn't really have a thesis project, but um, I had an interest in this location, this cliff mine. I had visited it uh, a year earlier and I was just taken in by it. I thought it was just the coolest thing I'd ever experienced, but it also didn't make any sense to me at all. Like, oh, interesting. I Like there were all these buildings and smokestacks and whatever, and you could go and find them, but I couldn't figure out how they worked together. Like I couldn't understand the size and scale of this landscape. And it was like, well, has anyone bothered to like map the site? And nobody had. We were awarded a grant to come out here to do a field school with undergrad and graduate students to map the cliff mine. And that was my thesis was basically to look at, take the historic record and then try to reconstruct the mine, how the mine's various features articulated and worked as a system. This era is not well represented on the landscape except here. And so this was a great opportunity to look at that first earliest mid 19th century phase of mining at the genesis of it all this is and, but so anyway we thought it would be really interesting as the rain may begin <laughs> uh -huh. to map the site and we had a couple of maps there were maps that were made and looking at that and then coming out on the ground and onto the landscape and measuring these things with tape and compass with our footsteps cool. you know measuring the distance of your footsteps cool. um gps equipment and then also you know like your total station civil engineering the guy standing on the road, making sure the road's straight, same equipment here. Huh. And we mapped the whole site and that took several years, but we did enough the first year, we, we focused on this industrial core and that's what we looked okay. at today. But you did get your degree. Did get they my did degree. Let you leave. And then like the next day started a PhD program yeah. and I just came right back here the next couple of years with other students who had other questions being asked. Uh, you never fully answer anything in archeology. span The, the okay. answer to any archeological question is more digging, okay. more research, you know. This is my favorite feature. This is where we did our res most of our research when I was involved. And so now we're standing in the stamp mill proper. This is where the rock was crushed. It extended about 30 some feet that way and you know, 20 feet that way. There were eight batteries of four stamps all in a line going okay. this way, all connected to one long cam uh, cylindrical camshaft running the length of this room. As that camshaft rotated, thanks to a steam engine that's over on the platform over there, it's engaging with, uh, it has teeth that engage with tappets or teeth of the stamps, and it could hit the tappet and lift the stamp. And when the camshaft, as it rotates, the key or the tooth is gonna disengage from the tappet, dropping the stamp onto the rock. Crush it, you flush it with water, pushes all the material through a grate, onto an apron where that you are standing um, where the stamps are, I'm standing where the apron is. Everything's made of wood, but you can see oh. exactly where the stamps were oriented, how they work together. Underneath the floor, there were, was plumbing. Plumbing is all made out of wood. And that, sh that flushed the water and other materials away out into what is now that kind of swampy area. You can see some of the stamp sand still here. What happened to this structure, this was a very large building, it was collapsed. And then in the early 1900s, the stamp sands were pushed up on top of it to kind of make a new building surface. And then a new smaller mill was built over there. And we have photos showing that change over time. When we were excavating, you could see 
how one building was sitting on top of another. There was a burn layer and oh. then and then um, soil, sand, whatever, no artifacts, and just a thin layer and then the the this wood floor that we're talking about right now. Cool. Is a burn layer just a layer of burned material? Yeah. Sounds... We we also know from the historic record that that later mill burned. Uh -huh. um, there's a photo of it after it burned. Okay. So we knew I knew going through that we would most likely find a layer of burnt material and then hopefully a preserved floor. Cool. And it's preserved because it's buried in stamp sands, which have copper in them, which is a biocide. So nothing's going to grow on that wood. Nothing's going to decompose cool. that wood. The second you expose the wood to the elements, okay. it starts degrading. Yeah. So the longer we had it open, the worse it was. Interesting. But that's, it's all been buried again to help preserve that. So you're like, great, we're going to, going to excavate over there. Like paint a picture for me of what that looks like. Is it just you're digging with trowels or? In this case, you know, you can dig with shovels. Okay. It depends on the soil and material mm -hmm. digging through, but it's also the questions you're asking because how finite, like how fine or what scale are the questions you're asking? It's mostly uh, trowels. You clear off the grasses and the duff and the root matter. Mm -hmm. You screen that looking for artifacts and then you dig through that. Depending on what you're digging, depending on the questions you're asking, you're either going to be digging at preset intervals, like levels, oh, okay. like maybe every five centimeters you stop huh. and you record what you have dug up, you know, take photographs, draw it, and then move on. Oh, interesting. And that way you can categorize all of your artifacts to each one of those levels. Or you might dig until you find a very distinct change in the soil or in this case, a wood floor, <laughs> or that burn layer. Mm -hmm. So maybe you dig five, six centimeters and you hit all this burn material. Mm -hmm. You stop, you don't remove it, you stop. Document, photograph, draw it, um, because you can't take it with you. Like what happens if you find a, a removable artifact you wanna learn more about? So all artifacts, so you have a collection strategy. You um, make a determination ahead of time that you're gonna collect everything or you're gonna collect a relative, uh, uh, a representative sample, let's say. So in a building like this, a wooden construction building, you know you're going to find a lot of nails. Well, how many nails do you need to be able to <laughs> say that these nails are from this era? Because nails can be dated. Everything gets bagged according to the unit that it was found or the test pit that it was found or the surface, if it was just surface collection. Mm -hmm. It's bagged and it's tagged. Everything is then stored in these bags and then brought back to the lab. At the lab, they're cleaned or processed. And then you can analyze those artifacts if your question requires that level mm. of study. Okay, so the question of like, is there a wood floor at the stamp mill still would not necessarily require you don't looking need to, at nails. Yep, you don't need to collect any artifacts if you don't want to. And so everything is stored in a safe, secure place. Mm -hmm. um, at, in this case, it was at Michigan Tech. Now we are holding those in for the property owner. We have okay. the permission of the property owner, the County Road Commission. Mm -hmm. They let us keep that stuff, okay, but it. it's technically theirs and they could always take it back anytime they wanted. The Cliff Mine Archaeology Project ended only a few years after it began, partly because of funding and partly because of less research interest from students and faculty. But there are still big picture questions here, especially about life in Clifton, the town across the way from the mine. Are there big picture questions you would love to have someone look into or are curious about? Yeah, I think um, more questions could be asked in the community of Clifton. Mm, okay. We have areas where it's clear that the housing structures were log cabins. We have areas where it's clear that the housing structures were framed buildings. And we can make assumptions and, well, informed assumptions mm -hmm. that people living in a log cabin generally probably lower down the social wrong than people living in framed homes. Mm. Finished framed homes as mm. opposed to rough hewn log cabins. Okay. Log cabins are also usually, especially on this site too, sited farther away from the mine. So there takes longer to get to work. There's social stratification. Some of those other questions about class and, and social stratification, those are, those are interesting, especially when it comes to consumption patterns. You know, are more people eating beef in the framed homes and the log homes or vice versa. And this would require a lot of okay. excavation because you'd have to have very large sample sizes. Mm -hmm. But can we see differences in, um, in, in terms of those, you know, those cultural differences? And who knows? I, that's just some stuff. We shouldn't forget about this place. We have a tendency to look at Quincy. We have a tendency to look at CNH and we go, and maybe the Copper Range Mines Champion, things like that, and we go, this is mining in the copper country. This is where it started. This is what set the stage. This is where Cornish technology met American capital and ingenuity and 
Irish and German and French labor got together and created this landscape, this extractive landscape that has all of these physical limitations. I mean, it's remote, it's got the lake around it, it has the seasons. It's, it's, this was the frontier in yeah. the middle of the 19th century. The gold rush obscures this and kind of we forget about it, but this was the first. And so I want people to take that away, that this place is very important. It deserves protection. You shouldn't loot. If you want to collect minerals, that's fine. The thing is, this place is why we are all here. It is the location um, that said, that told the, the rest of the country that you could make money. And you can come here, you can invest here, you can move here, you can work here, and you can have a life here. And now everyone else that lives here today is because of this one place, mm -hmm. in my opinion. There are other mines as well um, that were contemporary, the, the cliff north of the bridge, the Keweenaw. This is, this is the start, this is the beginning, and we should kind of protect it and revere it as such. There is so much to be learned here. We've only scratched the surface. And if it was properly preserved and properly cared for and managed, we would have those opportunities to do that. I love telling stories about interesting ways the world has changed and how those stories are still written on the landscape. But every now and then, I also enjoy stepping back and learning more about how we come to understand those stories. Because sometimes the journey really is the destination. Thanks for being here, and many thanks to Dr. Sean Goman for all of his time, insight, and expertise. Also, special thanks to those of you who support my work on Patreon and buy me a coffee. There was a lot of footage to cut down for this video, and because of your support, I was able to take the time to go through it all and make a longer video like this, which I was super excited about. So thank you. And if you're not a patron, hey, no worries. I'm still really glad you're here. Thanks again, and I'll see you soon.